Hello, everybody. All right. Um, well, this is very bright. Um, welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here, especially faces that I know pretty well, but even maybe even more exciting, some folks that I've never, never seen before. Um, my name is Aaron Pratt. I'm the Carl and Lily Forsheimer Curator of Early Books and Manuscripts here at the Ransom Center. Um, supported by an endowment from the Forsheimer Foundation, you're at the Ransom Center's annual Forsheimer Lecture, which, well, isn't really a lecture this time around. Um, this afternoon's event is a panel featuring two of my favorite colleagues and thinkers, DePaul University's Professor Megan Heffernan and Beinecke Library Curator Catherine James, and I'll also be saying some things. I was going to talk about the origin story of the broader collaboration between the Beinecke Library and the Ransom Center that this event forms a part of, but I decided last night that I would skip a folksy anecdote that would probably only be endearing to me and maybe Catherine um, in order to devote more time to our speakers, um, especially Catherine and Megan, our out-of-town guests. All you need to know for now is that, while it might seem obvious today that we would want to preserve really old books, the Gutenberg Bible, Galileo's first publications, the plays of Shakespeare, and while there were indeed people interested in owning old books in the medieval and early modern worlds, what the books that survive today themselves make clear is that what has counted as a perfect or ideal copy of an old book or the text it transmits was far from stable, changing from one generation to the next, especially once elite collecting really ramped up in the 19th century. I think all of the speakers here today believe that tracking these changes is important if we want to develop robust narratives about literary and cultural history. An exhibition up at the Beinecke's Yale Library, curated by tonight's speaker, Catherine James, considers the quest for the perfect text. And the exhibition in this building, curated by me, considers the quest for the perfect physical copy. Um, a combo essay collection and exhibition catalog, written by Catherine and me, um, takes up these two stories as well. I was really excited to invite Megan Heffernan to join today's conversation because she's begun thinking as part of what looks to be her next book project about the institutional history of book care and conservation, which is very much part of this story that Catherine and I have started telling. I am confident that her contribution to tonight's discussion will prove indispensable. So we're going to have three sort of sub 20 minute talks back to back, followed by what I hope will be a productive discussion amongst the three of us and all of you. First, we'll have Catherine James giving a talk entitled, fittingly enough, Collated. Catherine James is the curator of early books and manuscripts in the Osborne Collection at the Yale's Beinecke Library. Um, I will say that she does incredibly interesting work on early modern English collectors and antiquarians, and right now is completing a book, English Paleography in Manuscript Culture, 1500 to 1800, to accompany an exhibit at the Beinecke in spring 2020. Then I will give what I'm increasingly convinced is a really strange talk that finishes the formula, it's titled Perfect. As I've said, I'm the Forsheimer Curator of Early Books and Manuscripts here at the Ransom Center, and for my own research, I specialize in bibliography and the broader history of the book, especially as it concerns Eng early modern English literature, especially drama. I'm in the process of writing a book provisionally titled Collecting Playbooks, Making Shakespeare. That was weird to get my own intro. And finally, <laughs> Megan Heffernan will blow us away with a talk entitled Waste land, and that pause is meant to indicate a slash, so way slash land. Megan is assistant professor of English at DePaul University, where she researches and teaches early modern literature, poetry and poetics, Shakespeare, and book history. She has articles and reviews in very nice journals, including Shakespeare Quarterly, and she's completing her first book, Delight in Disorder, Making the English Miscellany, which recovers the formal design of printed poetry books. Her next study, which I've already mentioned, is tentatively titled Resilient Books, Archival Science in the Age of Precarity, or An Age of Precarity, sorry, Megan. I hope you'll stick around um, after the Q&A for a reception. Just outside the theater, we'll have staff handing out copies of Collated and Perfect, that publication that I mentioned, and the gallery will remain open until 7 for you to check out the Collated and Perfect cases, as well as the rest of stories to tell in our major show, The Rise of Everyday Design. I recommend one of two strategies if you've not yet seen what's up in the galleries. Either get a drink, down it, with proper decorum, of course, and then check out the galleries, or alternatively, check out the galleries and then get a drink that you consume leisurely. Um, with everybody's phones turned silent, we're off to the races. Um, first up, Catherine James, collated. 
Well, thank you, Erin. And I guess that leaves the opportunity for me to tell the folks the anecdote about the start <laughs> of the exhibit, which began with this, um, with this uh, exact image, um, which is much smaller in real life in, in a, a very, um, a very um, in innocuous printed book. And, and the exhibit um, began when I excitedly wrote Aaron saying, Aaron, we have to do an exhibit called Collated and Perfect on, on these collation statements. And um, it was one of those humorous moments where I felt as though I'd been having this conversation with Aaron for many years, but in fact had not. And so, so I view this in some ways as the exhibit that I've done with my imaginary friend, Aaron Pratt. <laughs> um, but I am so delighted to, um, to have had the chance to bring the two collections together in these exhibits running in parallel with each other and for the opportunity to, um, to, to work with Aaron in his new capacities of the Fortzheimer curator here. And so I, um, I am an early modern British historian, and so I tend to approach uh, questions about the text and textual perfection from an archival perspective, and, and looking really at the um, archival context, the political and emotional context in which um, collectors uh, come to, to form uh, their obsessions, uh, and, and often they, they are obsessions with the gathering of text together and with the uh, examination of the uh, standards by which texts are judged. And so in thinking about collated and perfect, which is a term adopted, as you can see, by the early 18th century um, bibliographic obsessive, a bibliomaniac, as the Victorian um, historian Thomas Frognell Dibden named him. Uh, this was his uh, particular mark by which he has come to be known in the book trade um, through the uh, s tens of thousands of books that he assembled in his collection before, um, under threat of bankruptcy, as so often meets uh, obsessive book collectors, he began to disassemble um, that collection in a series of, of auctions over the space of almost a decade that have permeated collect rare book collections around the world with this mark from Thomas Rawlinson, where he was, he was marking the books on the point of sale to say that they were collated and perfect or, or not collated, or not, uh, not or imperfect. Um, and so the question for me um, is always with this, um, what does it mean to take the text as a form of evidence? And this, I believe, was the question that was motivating Rawlinson in his collection. It's the question that I'd like to bring more broadly to discussion of book collecting, book collecting and our ideas of perfection and textual perfection. And so that when, when we think about the text as a form of evidence, what I mean by that is evidence in the living sense is something political, um, something that is charged and divisive, and evidence on issues on which people not only disagree, but around which they organize their political and their moral lives. And so in my thinking, collation and perfect, this mark as we find it here from Th Thomas Rawlinson is part of a longer discussion from early modern Britain through the present in which participants are asking about the relationship of these early modern categories, the factual, the empirical, the evidentiary to an idea of truth. And this is obviously a question which is still very much with us today. And so what I'd like to do here is to touch very briefly on three case studies that have shaped my understanding of this in the Anglo-American tradition. And the first of these is John Bale, the uh, Reformation propagandist and um, bibliographer in the 1530s, then second to turn to the Rawlinson brothers, Thomas and Richard Rawlinson in the early 18th century, and then very briefly to bring the discussion closer to the present in turning to Charlton Hinman, um, working on his edition of the first folio of Shakespeare in the mid 20th century. So, and this is a, you know, this is one of my favorite letters. Um, and you can tell that it's a snapshot, it's a photograph from the manuscript in the Cambridge University Library. So I apologize for the resolution of it. And it shows us John Bale, shown here with his wonderful beard, um, looking intently off into the middle distance. And I think, um, Starting with Bale is really to begin with the premise that ideas of completeness or perfection when thinking about an English textual heritage are always situated against an originating trauma of the English Reformation and the destruction of the monastic libraries and monastic book collections 
under Henry VIII when he broke with the Catholic Church and, and established himself as the head of the Church of England. And so this dispersal of the monastic collections was one that resounds in um, anecdotes that are um, observing these moments of transgression when the monastic books, which were sold essentially or just um, either dumped um, as, as waste, and it'll be really interesting to hear uh, Megan's uh, discussion of this later, or sold, uh, often they were confiscated for the Royal Library, or they were sold to private collectors as well. But there are many moments of eyewitness observation of uh, moments when texts were being used as material objects. And so the value of the text lay in its ability to plug a barrel, to line a pie pan, um, as is you know, a very commonly uh, recounted use, or to um, be used in jakes as, as bog roll, as toilet paper. Um, and so there, there are moment after moment when we have these accounts of this um, transition when the text is no longer visible as text, but becomes visible as an object. And to many of its eyewitness observers, this was one that, was, um, that brought also great emotional anxiety. And so this is a, a story that we have from the 1530s, um, and it is also documenting this moment when um, a, an English textual heritage, um, the historical and religious works that would provide textual evidence um, of uh, of a national history were also dispersed. And so at this moment in the 1530s, what we find really in what John Bale is so influential in documenting is a sense of an originating loss when, when the absence of an English textual heritage becomes the point against which subsequent uh, catalogers, observers, historians are, are, are working. And so we find this in this wonderful quote, which is actually years later. So, so at this moment, John Bale is writing to his friend, Matthew Parker, who has just been, um, who has recently been confirmed as Archbishop of Canterbury. And Parker, who himself is collecting English texts to document the history of the Church of England, Parker has asked Bale, what types of historical work he has found in his work um, collecting and observing books across uh, England, Wales, and Ireland. And so Bale, um, and it's a really, what, one of the things I find so interesting about this is that it's this really harrowing moment when Bale, he's much older now, um, he's uh, had periods of exile, um, and he is no longer the bilious Bale as he's been described by so many of his uh, contemporaries, but really a very tired and uh, despairing observer. And so here in 1560, um, Bale writes to, to Matthew Parker to describe the loss of his own library and how his own books, which he had kept, which he had assembled uh, during this moment of what he viewed as desecration, desecration of the monastic collections, Bale had been collecting books um, that, that he thinks have been stolen and lost um, in a moment that was where, where his library had gone beyond his control. And so he writes, he writes to Parker, again, his old friend, to talk about his eyewitness observation of the destruction of books in the 1530s, saying that some, and he's talking here about his own lost library, some I found in stationers and bookbinders, storehouses, some in grocers, soap sellers, and tailors that they're being used, they're being boiled down to make soap, they're being broken up to, uh, to use to reinforce um, the hems of clothing. Um, and other occupier shops, some in ships ready to be carried over the sea into Flanders to be sold, for in those uncircumspect and careless days, there was no quicker merchandise than, merchandise than library books. And so Bale here, and this is, I think, a really, um, a really formative description, and that, as you can see, he has both been concerned with himself personally trying to catalog an English literary and historical heritage. He produced catalogs of the books that he had seen and the books that he remembered seeing um, from England's collections. But he's also convinced that these books will be used as ammunition against England, that they will find their way into continental hands, both Catholic and other incarnations of the Protestant religion. And so one can also look at Bale's idea of completeness, of perfection in a library, but completeness especially, as a moment in which you are gathering a library together as an armament, 
um, and, and, and gathering ammunition in a war in which textual origins are taken as a form, as a viable form of evidence, something about which people care. And so this brings us to my next set of participants, these two brothers, um, Richard and Thomas Rawlinson, around which really the exhibition at the Beinecke has been organized around Thomas Rawlinson, as I've said, this obsessive book collector of the late 17th and early 18th century. And so a, a, a bibliomaniac who would be a formative enough influence that the Victorian uh, Dibden could describe him as such, could gather him into his darkly satirical, um, biting history of book collecting in England. And so Thomas Rowlandson, he's wonderful in that he actually lives up to this claim. He has a, an abs as a curator, um, I sympathize in his story, I see myself in him, but he's described by those around him as after inheriting the family fortune, he gave up any pretense of working in the legal profession and turned full time to book collecting. And he, he's famously described as sleeping in the hallway outside the four chambers that he had in, in one of the inns of court, Gray's Inn, because the rooms are entirely filled with books. So he has to kind of huddle in the, in the quarter outside. And then um, having entirely outgrown those spaces with his collections, he moved to London House um, in 1716 continued collecting and then having lost much of his fortune in the South Sea bubble um, had to disperse the collection um, through this series of 16 auctions um, from 1721 to 1733 that as I've said just um, have, have now filled the rare book collections around the world. Um, and so his contemporary uh, and, and one of the things that's actually really great about this is that uh, Dibden in describing Thomas Rawlinson because always here is the question of what makes somebody a true obsessive uh, with books. Um, there's always this kind of nervous, um, nervous observation of what the gateway is into true bibliomania. And, and for Thomas Rawlinson, it's, it's told in the, the histories about him, his pseudo-biographies, because of course Thomas never himself contributed to these, that it was a, it was a small annuity given by his grandfather. So it's the equivalent of a sort of $20 check that he would have every year, that it was specifically devoted to book collecting that led him on to this sort of terribly uh, emotionally uh, complicated arc of his life. And so, so those around him blamed his grandfather for Thomas Rawlinson's um, career. And so uh, Rawlinson's contemporary, William Oldest, himself a bibliomaniac, uh, described Rawlinson after his death in 1725. And as he lived, so he died in his bundles, piles, and bulwarks of paper in dust and cobwebs. <laughs> and so, so the great part about this um, is that Thomas, of course, had a brother. <laughs> And so here he is, he's the eldest son, and he's squandered the family fortune. He's lost all the riches in uh, the South Sea bubble. He's totally um, spent the rest of it on books. Um, and his brother Richard um, learned of this uh, while he was off on the Grand Tour, happily you know, chatting away with people overseas, um, and learns that this terrible um, mishap has befallen the, the family fortune. And so he has to come home and start uh, tending to Thomas. Um, and so the story of Thomas Rawlinson is in many ways the story of his brother, Richard Rawlinson, who himself went on to become one of the formative collectors um, of the uh, archives of his contemporaries and whose collections are now held in the Bodleian Library. And so we have the story from Dibden, who focuses entirely on Thomas Rawlinson as an obsessive um, book collector. But then we also have Thomas as the brother of Richard Rawlinson. And so the question that I am brought to with um, Collated and Perfect with Thomas, and Rawl with Thomas Rawlinson's uh, bookmark is to ask why in particular, why he actually became a book collector and what both he and his brother Richard were trying to accomplish um, with this truly, um, with the extent and reach of their collecting in this particular period. And the answer to this, I think, lies not in collecting itself, which I think can often be a distraction from the true political or emotional motivations uh, behind this sort of endeavor, but really in the uh, political significance of what Thomas and Richard Rawlinson were trying to do in this period. Both Thomas and Richard were non-jurors. 
So in this period, what that meant is that they refused to swear the oath of allegiance to the state, and they refused to abide by the reformed Church of England. And so they were politically marginalized figures. They were unable to hold office. They were unable to receive uh, formal university degrees, or, and also unable to hold any type of public position. And they weren't alone in this. Most of the many of the librarians and collectors who were their contemporaries were themselves also non-jurors. And so there's this really fascinating world of people working alongside collections or building collections in this period who were doing so because they were deliberately politically motivated to amass collections of textual evidence, to, to build these collections of a literary and historical textual heritage that would allow them to begin to um, participate in this ongoing political controversy that surrounded, um, that surrounded the issue of the political, so the role of the political state in Britain in this period. And so their collecting was politically motivated, much in the tradition of John Bale and Matthew Parker, as an effort to assemble these materials together. And so this brings me to my slide, which I think is, is one of the most fascinating examples of collation that I have encountered. And so after his death, Richard Rawlinson um, dispersed his, he was a responsible collector, unlike his brother Thomas. He, uh, he set out the terms of his, of what should happen to his collection after his death. And they were quite complicated. He dispersed his collections to the Bodleian and to his friends. He left his collection of skeletons to the worshipful company of surgeons. And he dispersed his body as well. And so he specifically designated that his corpse was to be buried in a lead coffin that was bound in Morocco in gilt, much like his books, and buried in St. Giles Church in Oxford. And then his heart was to be placed in, his urn, in this urn at St. John's College. And I'm always, you know, you can see that I found this on findagrave.com. <laughs> so, so I'm always a little skeptical until you actually go and see these in person. You know, it does, does seem to be Rawlinson, but you know what of his heart actually survives in the urn? And so there are technical questions that have yet to be explored in this. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that in his grave, bound in the, cof the lead coffin bound in Morocco and guilt, um, Richard Rawlinson specified that he was to be buried holding the head of a particular political martyr in his hand. Uh, uh, the head that he had, with foresight, bought beforehand. <laughs> so the head was of Christopher Lair. It's a named head of a Jacobite who had been executed in 1722 for his participation in a particular in a political plot, the details of which are irrelevant, um, but whose body had been taken and buried by his fellow political conspirators underneath the floor of a pub. And so Rawlinson had bought the head and had stipulated that he was to be buried with it so that in the great collation exercise of the Last Judgment, when his body would be reassembled before God, Rawlinson would be resurrected as the reliquary of a man he considered to be a saint. And so the question that was raised by his political enemies, and I love this moment, the viciousness of the political commentary in this period, is how do we know that the head was real, right? <laughs> and so the suspicion or the satirical observation by his enemies was that, in fact, Rawlinson had been duped, that as a collector of, of Jacobite relics, he had, been, he had been pawned off with a head that was not, in fact, that of Christopher Lair. It was an inauthentic head. And so there's this question that's raised about how the fact of, of the head relates to a larger truth. And you can see that in John Nichols' uh, literary anecdotes, the, the, the um, formative story, history of so much of uh, book collecting in this period that John Nichols relates this um, and the, the mocking uh, question raised by Rawlinson's enemies. Imagine this venerable antiquary and his companion waking out of their slumber here at the end, at the, you know, at the last judgment. How would the former be amazed and mortified on his perceiving that he had been taking to his bosom, not the head of the counselor, but the worthless pate of some strolling mendicant, some footpad, or some superannuated harlot? And so there's this really dark vision of Rawlinson there, dismembered, um, being brought back together into a perfect whole, um, but there waking up next to somebody who might not, in fact, be a saint at all. <laughs> 
And so that brings me, um, with some humor, to Charlton Hinman um, and, his, um, and his resurrection of the first folio of Shakespeare's works. And what we see here is not, not Hinman, but, but Fredson Bowers, the eminent bibliographer um, and Guggenheim fellow with another Guggenheim fellow, Matthew uh, Brucoli, and they're using the uh, collator, the machine that Charlton Hinman um, created to, um, to compare iterations of text with each other. And you can see a lot, I think, I think it's important to note that you can see a lot about the um, roles of class, race, and gender in Anglo-American bibliography <laughs> by looking at this photograph as well. Um, but so, so Hinman was a graduate student at the Univers University of Virginia. His thesis on Othello was supervised by Fredson Bowers. And then um, Hinman went off to work in World War II as a cryptographer for the United States Navy. So after the war, he returned to this project of perfecting the textual understanding of what he described as the literary monuments of the Renaissance. And so again, recurring to a trope that John Bale had raised in 1560 in writing to Matthew Parker. And so Hinman, um, as his bibliographical contemporaries, had focused in particular on Shakespeare. And so he turned himself to a project very much of the period of creating a technological and a mechanical approach to textual analysis using this collating machine that he designed and built. And I should add that there's a really fascinating history of um, the machines for collating and this type of mechanical intervention in um, textual analysis, which is, which is really interesting to look at in its own right. And so Hinman's edition of the first folio of Shakespeare draws together, having done the comparative work with the collections of the Folger Shakespeare Library, Hinman's edition of the first folio of Shakespeare draws together what he viewed as the most perfect example of each page of the first folio. Um, and so he created an edition of the text that in and of itself never actually existed in any one book or material incarnation. So it's a fascinating moment in 20th century bibliography and in a response to this idea, this question of collation and perfection, um, in which Hinman fabricates an essentially imagined first folio um, in an imagined edition of the uh, works of Shakespeare. And so collation in its end game in the 20th century moved to a form of perfection that obviated its own materiality. And so I think I'll, I'll close there with, this, um, with these three examples and, and leave this really with the, uh, the anxiety that I think these three examples show us about the relationship of the material text and then the idea of the text in these ongoing political discussions, whether in the wake of World War II and the Cold War um, in the Anglo-American tradition or in the um, more concertedly um, political context of John Bale and Parker um, in the wake of the foundation of the Church of England and the commentary, the, the brutal commentary and revision of that in the late 17th and early 18th century. Thank you. All right, so as the uh, big title on the slide indicates, I'm here to talk more about the perfect part of collated and perfect than the collated, but because perfection, as the formula suggests, comes only after the act of collation, I'm afraid I have to talk about collation for a good chunk of my talk today. This is unfortunate. Strap in, so, so here we go. All right, so there are two main types of collation that people do to or with books, and at this point, I'm pretty sure that these two uses of the term emerged independently out of the words general meeting from Latin confera to bring together, but for understandable reasons are difficult for us both to identify in the first place and to keep separate as we pursue the entangled histories of old books as physical objects and our interest in the text they transmit. I want to say that it's useful, maybe even important, to keep these separate, however, if the distinction, even if the distinction is in many ways a fine one. So, one of the two bookish things that gets called collation involves what textual editors do. 
bringing together copies of texts and comparing them with one another, often, usually, with an eye toward making a decision about the, what the best version of the text is, whatever the criteria for determining best might be. With, say, Hamlet, this type of collation would entail identifying the differences between the notoriously weird but delightfully brisk first quarter of 1603, the second quarter of 1645, and the first folio at the very least. The collator of a text brings different witnesses of that text together, manuscripts, printed editions, different copies of the same printed edition, to compare and contrast them, hopefully with some degree of rigor. That, in the very roughest sense, is what textual collation involves, bringing together for comparison. Let's see here. Oh, shucks. It's starting me at the end. All right, much better. Here's the title page of the 1611 first edition of Randall Cotgrave's French and English Dictionary. Its primary definition of collation in its various forms emphasized the comparative aspect that characterizes textual collation and quite a few other uses of the term. So here are those definitions. The noun, a collation, quote, is a comparing or examining of one thing by another in a very general sense, by no means restricted to texts. Looking for a new lawnmower, undertake a collation at Home Depot, or something like that. The adjective, um, in much the same vein, something collated is something that has been compared with or examined with another or by another. And then the verb, which moves beyond the general and gets specifically at at least one type of textual collation to examine a copy, by which we're talking about a reproduction of a text, by the original, to confer or compare one writing or thing with another. Now, if you're able to look past the initial definitions that I just read, you'll see that another use of collation in its various forms was for meals and after meal repasts. As I understand it, this use for meals is a metonymic one. Meals typically happened even more so in the early modern period than now amongst company during a bringing together of people, which is where the collation relation to meals comes from. In fact, it's this bringing together, as I mentioned before, that joins the various uses or senses of the word collation together. What the collation of textual collation emphasizes is something you can do after things have been brought together, comparing texts or comparing meal companions. The other type of collation, which is collating books as physical objects in order to establish them as perfect or imperfect, does not emphasize the act of comparison, even though it, as we will see, depends on it. It's more interested in its use in the bringing together of the basic units that comprise them. Or in the collated and perfect formula, it's what we might think of as the having been brought together. The collated book is the one where the parts are all there. So here's a book very well known to scholars of bibliography and or the broader history of the book a 1683 volume of Joseph Moxon's Mechanic Exercises, which documents for the first time in great detail in England how printed books were made in early modern England. In his handy works applied to the art of printing, Moxon covers everything from typecasting, setting of type into pages and forms, inking and printing, and aspects of gathering and warehousing. It's during this last bit of the process, the gathering and warehousing, where we get collation. It's also during this last bit when a given book becomes perfect for the very first time. In the production of a printed book, Moxon tells us that after all of the sheets have been printed, they need to be gathered into copies. To gather a book, the warehouse keeper takes one sheet off of every heap, each heap containing every copy of a given sheet that was printed for the edition, say six or 800 or 1,000 copies if we're talking about the first edition of a play by Shakespeare or by Shackerley Marmion beginning with the last sheet, the end of the book, and ending at the beginning, the first sheet. At the end of this process, the warehouser ends up with a stack of sheets that's ready to store as a discrete copy of the whole book. Now we're at the stage of collation, the quality control phase. Now mind you, this is before we have anything that can be read as a codex, right? The kind of book that we would pick up from a bookshelf or check out and look in the reading room. The sheets aren't even folded into gatherings yet, let alone being bound. What we have here are the sheets have been put together into a copy in the warehouse. So after, after gathering, which Moxon talks about in the context of collation, you just have a stack of sheets. That's the first time a book gets collated. Collated by the warehouse keeper and determined perfect, as we might say. Notice that 
not unlike in the French of Cotgrave's dictionary. The verb is not to collate, but it's to collation. As Moxon writes, to collation or collate a book, you first, quote, examine whether the whole number of sheets that belong to the book are gathered in the book. And then you make sure there aren't any duplicates, and then you make sure all the sheets are stacked in the right orientation, which is going to help the binder down the line. Now, once the warehouse keeper has done that, having examined that his book is perfect, he knocks and folds it up for storage. The book is perfect when the gathering has been confirmed as successful, as error-free. We can see this definition applied well before Moxon wrote his treatise, and that it was legible beyond the printing house itself. Here's a glossographia, or a dictionary of hard words from 1656. Quote, bookbinders, this is within the definition for collation, bookbinders and sellers also use the word in another sense, as when they say, to collation a book, that is, to look diligently by the letters or figures at the bottom of every page, to see that nothing be wanting or defective. This definition, like an almost another almost identical one in a dictionary from two years later, shows that collation in the sense of confirming that the sheets are indeed gathered together was one that had currency beyond the printing house and at least had made its way into the argo of the binder, who at least ideally performed another act of quality control and collated again before turning the book into something that feels more like a book, something you can read, and also into the vocabulary of the retail seller, who presumably, in order to keep getting customers, needed to make sure that he wasn't selling complete copies either. Notice that Unlike in the definitions concerning textual collation, here and in Moxon's, there's no mention of any control against which perfection is determined. That is, there's no indication that collating a book in this printing and book trade sense involves comparison, even though, of course, the collator has to have some knowledge of what sheets and leaves a book needs to have in order to be complete or perfect. Now, many of Europe's first printed books included what is known as a registrum, or a register, at the end, helping collators, whether warehousers, binders, retailers, or owners, know what the book should include. Here, in a Venice edition from 1491, the book has seven gatherings, A through G, six with four bifolia, or eight leaves each, and one with two bifolia, or four leaves each. The book itself provides the standard against which collation can measure perfection. Later books, though, don't have these registers, and there's no indication I've yet seen, especially by the time we get to the later 16th and 17th centuries, that folks outside the printing house world would have been given, in any form, the kind of information that earlier registers provide. In most cases, the warehouse keeper would have done their job correctly and sent on perfect books, but by the time a book had made its way from the printer and or publisher to a retailer, to a binder, and then to a reader, and especially after that, to other readers or back into the book trade as a second-hand copy. How would somebody collating know whether a book is perfect or not? This is the challenge that the textual collator faces too. How do we know what the text should include? But the emphasis on comparing copies and their definition of collation suggests at least the basics of a method for figuring that out. Now, at this stage of my research, I've not scoured all of Europe's early definitions of collation that tackle its use in the printing house and book trade, so it may very well be that some definitions of the act of collation do take care to indicate how perfection should be determined. But I'd like to suggest here that, even if the English definitions that I've seen don't fully capture how the process of collating printed books was understood by people during the early modern period, there's for us at least a heuristic value in recognizing that bibliographical collation often occurs absent a clear standard and that when books have been adjudicated perfect, we might ask, on what evidence, against what measure? In the register on the screen, everything is pretty easy. The collation follows the alphabet, and when you get to the end of the fourth leaf on G, an index, the leaf itself says, finis, or the end. So you would reasonably be able to guess that you have a complete book even without the register. But oh man, wish, wish that other books were this easy. Um, and so now we're back to the first folio, much to our chagrin probably. Um, this is the first edition, uh, the first folio of Shakespeare's plays published in 1623. Um, it brings 36 of his plays together for the first time. It's well-trodden territory. In fact, this is one of the famous, most famous books ever printed, possibly, and possibly even more than the Gutenberg Bible. It's, it's probably the book that's been studied the most thoroughly by bibliographers. And yet, 
I want to suggest that there's at least one way in which we don't really know what constituted a perfect copies in the days, weeks, or perhaps even months after it first hit London's bookshops. All right. So this is the collation formula of the 1623 first folio as given by the Folger Shakespeare Library. Um, that glossographia definition had mentioned not only that printed letters were to appear as signatures printed on sheets to aid collation, but also that other figures might appear. And we sometimes get a few figures in here. I absolutely do not have the time to explain everything that is going on in this collation formula, but I hope you can take in the complexity of this as it stands before you on the screen. And trust me when I say that collating the first folio is in no way an obvious affair. The most famous example of the first folio being weird concerns the play Troilus and Cressida, which almost didn't make it into the first folio due to a rights dispute with the publisher who had a monopoly over that play's publication. Scholars and bibliographers know that story very well, so I won't tell it to you now. But the short is that the play ultimately did make it into the volume, though not before the table of contents at the beginning of the book was printed. And this would have been printed, like other preliminaries in many early modern books, toward the very end of the printing process after the body of the text had been done. In the Forsheimer copy, um, as in a number of other copies, Troilus has been added to the catalog in manuscript, showing that it was indeed present in copies, and the, the, the catalog itself needed to accommodate that. But that's not the story I'm interested in today. So here's the little bit of the story that I want to tell, which helps us see the difficulty that collation poses when there's not a clear control against which perfection can be determined. I just said that the first folio preliminaries, the part that includes the catalog I just mentioned, would have been printed last. Um, and here's the collation formula just for them. And this is, we can deal with this. This just says, um, this says that there's a standard folio choir of six leaves. So three sheets that have been nested and then folded over once to yield a choir, six leaves, three sheets, plus a single leaf added after the first leaf, that A1 leaf, and then two leaves, a single sheet folded over once, so another sheet that has been added after the fifth leaf. Here's this uh, visualized, and I've taken this um, from a very helpful new Folger resource called the DIY's First Folio, and this will help things look a little clearer. Leaves labeled one through six here are that standard folio choir of three nested sheets making six leaves or 12 pages. You can see those opening out from the spine fold at the center at the bottom of the image. This is standard stuff. On the left, um, that single leaf that's the title page, that one that's sticking out the plus one. That's the title page with the famous portrait of Shakespeare on it, which we just looked at a second ago. That leaf had to go through two different presses, a letter press with type in it, like the rest of the book, and a roller press that could print from the engraved plate with the portrait illustration. This printing strategy, where a title page with an engraving on it is printed as an individual leaf and then added to the front, sometimes after a leaf that explains or comments on the frontispiece, like we see with that facing Ben Jonson poem, that's attested elsewhere. There's really nothing too surprising about adding in a title page with engraving on it at the front of a volume, though there, it would have been possible for the printer to have integrated the engraving into a traditional folded choir if he really wanted. Um, the same year that the folio was printed, that same printer issued another work with the, the title page integrated in a similar way. So this is, this is pretty standard stuff. Now, um, the other inserted material here is a little bit weirder. Um, and let's walk through the whole choir so that we can sort of see what's going on here. So here's the back of the title. The, here's the first leaf of the main choir, the one with the poem by Ben Jonson. And on the right is the individual title leaf that's not part of that choir but was added in, that plus one that was on the left. Here's the back of the title page which has a book plate on it and an added leaf on the, sorry, here's the back of the title page, that added leaf. And on the right, it's the beginning of the editor's dedicatory epistle. And you can see if you look very, very closely that it's signed A2 at the bottom in the center. And here's the back now of the A2 of the main choir, the end of that dedicatory epistle, and on the right is A3, which is also signed. It's the famous letter from the editors to quote, the great variety of readers. And now as we march on, we get a blank at the back of that great variety of readers letter, and on the right, um, although it's not signed, is the beginning of a series of poems in memory of Shakespeare, and that's A4 of the main choir. So we've had all leaves except for the title leaves that are part of that main choir. Okay, so now we have the back of A4, 
which continues Ben Jonson's commendatory poem, and then the front of A5, which has another poem on it. Both of these are still part of that main choir of six leaves. Now we're at the rear of A5, which notably is blank. Then we get the beginning of that single two-leaf insertion, that one-sheet two-leaf insertion. It has two more commendatory poems on it. And now we're in this territory. OK, so here's the back of that leaf now. Um, in addition, that, that first leaf in that edition, and the front of the second leaf, which contains the names of the principal actors in all of these plays. Um, the list includes William Shakespeare, the famous actor Richard Burbage, the two editors of the first folio, and a number of other names well known to theater historians. So then you flip to the back of that, and now we've reached the end of that insertion. Here we get then A6, that final leaf in the main six leaf choir. It has the table of contents, which I had shown you before, and its back is blank, and then the tempest begins with a new signature signed A, and the book marches forward, though not without complication. OK, so back to that added sheet of two leaves. And this is where things get, I mean, we've been in technical territory a while now, but things get even weirder now. This is the opening um, that I have on display in the gallery. And these are facsimile leaves. They're fakes, although they weren't ones that were meant to deceive. I mean, I have to say, as a quick aside, I'm really proud to have put one of the finest copies of the first folio on display and only shown the fake parts of it. So, so everything we know suggests that this sheet was missing by the year 1660 when a man named Richard Newdigate signed the book. The volume has been rebound, though, so it's conceivable that the leaves were lost at some point, this, this two-leaf insertion. But the very nice condition of the surrounding leaves Combined with the book, the fact that the book has extremely well-documented provenance going back to not too long after the book was published, points strongly to the conclusion that they had never been part of the volume before the facsimiles were added. The book remained in the Newdigate family until it was auctioned by Sotheby's in 1920, and then made its hands into Carl For the library of the Forsheimer Library shortly thereafter. It was very possibly in the Newdigate family from the beginning, in fact. Um, and perhaps my favorite part of this story uh, is that the winner at Sotheby's outbid Henry Clay Folger, the folio hoarder par excellence. Although, but because the Forsheimer does have three first folios, I, I probably can't be super critical. But I still, I still like it. Um, when William A. Jackson cataloged this book for the Forsheimer catalog on the printed catalog in 1940, he noted that one could easily cite a half dozen copies otherwise complete, which lack this two-leaf sheet. He concludes that it's, quote, not unlikely that several copies left the shop without these leaves, and I happen to agree with him. A5, the leaf with the second commendatory poem on it, has a blank verso, and the bifolium in question is unsigned, which inclined Jackson, quite understandably, to think that the added sheet was something of an afterthought, or at least something that came along after the rest of the choir had been planned. And if it had been planned, because if, if, because if it had been planned from the beginning, it's hard to imagine why Jaggard would have gone about printing it this way. He could have printed um, the choir as a choir of eight leaves. It would have been nested more traditionally. So something is weird is going on here that suggests something about the belatedness of this material. Um, but of course, despite the fact that there was a good argument um, for its makeup for its makeup prior to the addition of the facsimile leaves as being its makeup as sold in the 17th century, that is, there's a good argument um, for its makeup having lacked these leaves initially, other copies accessible to 19th and early 20th century collectors had these leaves. So a fully desirable copy had to have them too. We have, com we have collectors comparing their copies against those in other collections. Um, and what we can see emerging here is a kind of maximalist definition of what constituted perfection. You just want more. And this is where I think there's value to having observed the problem of not having a clear standard for judging perfection during collation. Um, that this, this, or rather, there's a value to having observed that the problem of not having a standard is something of an absent presence in those definitions. It may help us articulate something at least a little bit new about the history of the first folio, which is very difficult to do. And I actually, I legitimately, this is not a joke, I actually woke up sweating earlier this week when I realized that I had backed myself into a corner by deciding to talk about the first folio, because you really have to get quite precise to say something interesting about it. Um, I could have done something on Thomas James Wise or the Tarleton Law, Law, Law Library's Rastel Dictionary, which are both in the exhibit, 
But I, but I thought that it would actually be worth doing a kind of deep dive into, into what can happen when you pay really close attention to things like collation and the material construction of books. Um, what I think we have here is a case where, at some point, a book that most likely had been collated and deemed perfect by a warehouse keeper, a bookbinder, a bookseller, and at least one retail book buyer was perceived to be lacking at some point thereafter. What was once perfect became imperfect, teaching us that, absent something like a registrum or documentation provided by the publisher, what counts as perfect is subject to change over time, or simply from collector to collector. That is, because the assessment of perfection, imagined to be something essentially objective, perhaps even scientific, and think back to the Hinman collator that Catherine showed, this sort of scientific pursuit of generating, doing collation and generating perfection, this, this is in fact something very contingent, um, suitable for analysis and interpretation of the kind that traditional humanities scholars are well poised to do. The problem is that even if we know that the leaves have been added, the fact of addition in its own confirms an unquestioned assumption that they should have been there, making it hard for us to recognize the possibility that maybe, if we're interested in the earliest history of the book, that they shouldn't have been there or that they might not have been. Um, and one final wrinkle. Jackson, Forsheimer's cataloger, knew that the book lacked the extra preliminary sheet, but thought that the copy now contains genuine originals. Um, and this is, um, this is still said in the newest, the newest censuses of Shakespeare folios, that, that this copy, these leaves you're looking at, are genuine originals that have been inserted. On behalf of Forsheimer, Jackson had located a pair of original leaves that had been burned in a fire, I believe, at the, the bookbinder of Revere and Son, or Rivier and Son. Um, which were then expertly handled by the bindery at Revere and Son to extend the margins and replace missing rules at the top. But these leaves, although Jackson had procured them, were never in fact inserted. Um, but Jackson didn't realize this when he did the catalogers. And as I said before, bibliographers into this century, the 21st, have continued to describe the copy as complete with supplied originals. And you can see one of those genuine originals that were never inserted in the exhibit over, over there. The inlay work commissioned by somebody like John Philip Kimball in the late 18th century that you'll see in the ex exhibition and publication is pretty clunky and attempts to hide nothing. But by the time we get to the late 19th century, bookbinders could repair leaves with other paper and fill in lost text with pen and ink so expertly that it can be very difficult to detect shenanigans. They could even match chain lines, and if needed, they could watch ma match watermarks. The high premium placed on completeness for perfection has not infrequently left us with artifacts um, that conceal their own histories. It is here that we're well into the territory of what are often called sophisticated or made up books, copies that have been adulterated with leaves not original to them. So many of the books that we work with, in fact, especially for scholars of early English drama or poetry, have been sophisticated in both senses of the word adulterated, but also made attractive to those with sophisticated, discerning, or refined tastes. Our perfect folios in many, are in many cases arguably as much a materialized reconstruction of a 19th or 20th century idea of how the folio um, should be, the kind of retrospective imagination of what a 1623 folio would be shot through the imaginary of a collector from the 19th or 20th century. And I want to say in conclusion, that we do well to approach all old books with caution, but, or and, with interest in the longer histories that their current forms preserve. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to Catherine and especially to Erin for putting together their exhibits and inviting me today. I'm delighted to be part of this sort of perfect collation of conversations. Um, so I'm going to be approaching this topic from a somewhat contrary position. How should we describe texts that resist every sense of order and coherence and value? If the bibliographic terms collated and perfect express collectors' desires for full, complete books, what are we to do with the materials that fall outside of those standards? What are the ethics of our modern decision to collate and perfect texts that may never have looked that way when they were first made, like the folio? Um, and more than just terminology, I want to think about these as questions that 
um, animate the stories that we tell about our books and that inform how we relate to our cultural past today. So I'm going to be thinking through these issues in the context of some manuscripts and printed books at the Folger Shakespeare Library that demonstrate a heavy use and reuse almost to the point of destruction. These texts were at multiple points in the past four centuries cast aside as waste. But while waste is the semi-technical term for reused sheets of paper and vellum, these items never reached a landfill. We still have them today because they were picked up and given a new life multiple times over, first as the bindings of other books, and then as fragments in the Folgers collection. Such textual reuse was less a singular act of destruction and more an extended process of recycling, albeit a recycling that held, held little regard for original function and value. This research is part of a new project that I'm starting on the history of book conservation and care. In studying the long life of early modern books, I'm interested in the influence not only of individual collectors, but also of institutions, the research libraries that were gaining prominence across the late 19th and early 20th centuries. When the collections that had long been held in private hands began to be consolidated at the Folger, here at the Ransom Center, at the Newberry, the British Museum, the Bodleian, and other public and private libraries, the priorities of these institutions influenced the future state of their holdings. Decisions about which items to purchase and to sell off, about how readers should access printed books and manuscripts, about the extent of interventions for textual wear, have all contributed to what our early modern collections look like today. This is a material history of reading at scale and across multiple moments in time. It is, therefore, a history that exceeds the influence of any single individual, since what I am tracing is a shared investment in the survival of texts that might easily have perished. My suggestion today is that we might take the longer purview of institutional collections as an opportunity to unsettle our commitment to chronology. The discipline of book history has traditionally produced very nuanced, incredibly nuanced accounts of how text changed over time, explaining the diachronic split between current and past approaches to bibliography. But I think we need as well to read for the synchronic history of preservation, for all the techniques that aim to protect the past, even if those practices of washing, mending, and repairing seem destructive today. So with this multi-temporal approach, I want to consider the history of caring for early modern books as an object lesson in how our culture might endure when confronted with the ravages of time and an increasingly precarious future. So, manuscripts in the Folgers XD 515 range of call numbers are legal documents that were salvaged from the bindings of other books in the collection. Some are large pieces of parchment that were once wrapped around the boards of folios, or smaller portions that were provisionally um, stitched around pamphlet collections. Some are tiny scraps of paper. Some are so faded they can hardly be read. Some are clearly legible. Comprised of just 46 items, the XD 515 manuscripts are also textually varied. These manuscripts come from multiple different kinds of legal documents from all over England and are in both Latin and English. What unites the XD 515 manuscripts is an inverse relation between their value as texts and as objects. That is, between the moments in which they were read and in which they were not. At some point in the 17th century, these manuscripts lost their authority as legal instruments, perhaps because of the terms of a lease or marriage settlement had expired. While they were no longer valued as readable documents, they gained a new function and a new future as tools that could protect other books. In the Folgers printed collections, I've been able to trace them back to everything from prose romances to atlases to legal statutes. Used either in whole or pieces as bindings for texts that were, at the moment of compiling more valuable, these discarded manuscripts entered the Folger library as hidden parasites traveling within the nooks and crannies of a more legible bibliographic history. In the 20th century, these manuscripts were once again cast away in a campaign to save the fragile remnants of the past. The hybrid manuscript and printed books were wearing each other down, eating away at the texts they were meant to protect, and so they were unstitched, collated, repaired, rebound with modern boards, and recatalogued by the Folgers mid-century curator, Giles Dawson, who was invested in making his collection as perfect as it could be. 
in TypeScript, TypeScript notes bound into the back of many of these very sturdy new volumes, Dawson included collation formulas that remarked on the poor quality of the manuscripts, as in this note from 1966, in which he observed, this work was stabbed and stitched in a leaf from an old manuscript on vellum, with another outer sheet of vellum, perhaps added later, both sheets filthy, tattered, and torn. The story of the XD515 manuscripts might have ended there, with a privileging of identifiable printed materials over ephemeral handwritten documents, a casting aside of all the components that were in excess of the idealized collation formula. But the Folgers manuscripts curator, Letitia Yendel, recognized the potential future value of the disbound sheets and entered them into the library's collection by assigning them a new range of call numbers. In this act of salvage, Yendel once again inverted the relationship between material and textual value. Her curatorial files attempted, to the extent possible, when they were legible, to read these manuscripts that had been deemed dirty and decrepit, and she recovered the people, the places, and the legal relationships they once expressed. So I want to pause here to clarify that while I'm reading these items within an ecology of waste and reuse, I mean neither to criticize Dawson's interventions nor to elegize the loss of the original hybrid books. Dawson's desire to separate manuscript from print and to collate printed sheets, even when he had to conjecture from the fragmented remnants, this is what's left of the title page today. It's an amazing like, attempt to remap the fragments. Um, from the fragments was characteristic of a mid-century bibliography that aimed to restore the ideal form of books that had not always survived intact. Such repairs now seem to destroy traces of early use, but when read within a longer trajectory of book care, we might actually see them as an echo of the initial decision to disregard the legal content of these manuscripts, using them as tools to protect other unprinted books. Whatever the shifting technologies of conservation, waste bindings emblematize an investment in the continued vitality of texts an orientation to the past that is conditioned by a desire for survival into the future, no matter how imperfect they might seem now. Waste is a human category, one way to name how we attribute value to the physical world. Etymologically, it derives from Latin wastus for empty and was first applied to uninhabited land, the wilderness beyond the reaches of civilization. But if waste describes the open place, that, the open space that was untamed by human cultivation, it also, and somewhat paradoxically, refers to natural resources that have been ravaged or destroyed, particularly in the legal context of land use. In 1598, John Manwood's treatise and discourse of the laws of the forest defined waste as the result of mismanaging the complex ecosystem. The forest was a jurisdiction maintained for royal hunting, and it thus required both untamed land and abundant wild animals for the king to kill. Manwood writes, this word waste is taken in the same sense that a spoil is, particularly spoiled pasture or coverts, the thickets that sustain the king's deer. To waste is to spoil or consume the resources that ensure the future survival of the royal refuge perhaps by harvest, harvesting trees for timber or clearing and domesticating the protected woods to turn them into pasture. Waste, of course, though, describes not only spoiled land, but also things, the partially consumed detritus that society has cast aside. The classic definition if, of trash is Mary Douglas's matter out of place, to which Brian Thrill adds that waste is not only matter out of place, but also out of time. Waste is the temporary name we give to the affective relationships we have with our unwanted objects. It is expended desire. Waste is every object plus time. That's all thrill. So as a designation of spent desire, waste is a trace of the, neg sorry, a negative trace of the worth that has been stripped away over time the value lost by wear, by shifting fashions, or by human indifference. Commercially, waste was applied to commodities that could no longer be sold as they had been intended. So I have another example from Moxon. In 1677, Joseph Moxon calculated waste into the price of his mechanic exercises, a treatise on the trades that was sold in separate sheets. 
and which Moxon anticipated selling unevenly. Once the more popular components had been purchased, customers were likely to desire not the rest. The remainder of the unsold exercises was rendered unperfect, and all that will remain, Moxon laments, will be waste paper on my hands. But these remainders were not without an alternative future, since Moxon could have gathered up the unperfect copies to sell off to a different market. They might have gone on to wrap pies or cheeses, been layered together to form pasteboard, lined storage boxes, or the boards of book bindings, and perhaps, as Catherine has already told us, they might meet their final end in the privy. Waste here is not simply trash to be thrown away. It rather names the superfluous remnants of commercial desire, a category that measures the draining out of one kind of value, but the simultaneous emergence of another, a spectral trace of worth in the sheets that could not be included in any perfect copy of Moxon's exercises. So when we read waste items, we are reading not only the tattered remnants of past value, but also and crucially, objects whose imperfect, ravaged state is a testament to how texts have endured beyond the point when they should have vanished. Waste carries the past forward into the future precisely because it withstands change. And the history of waste then, we might think of as a synchronic narrative of endurance that flouts the natural and cultural forces that should have long ago destroyed materials without currency. To my mind, the question becomes, what should we do with waste? How should we hold on to partially consumed texts? And what systems of value should we fit them into? Care and destruction, conservation and consumption are intimately connected. Perhaps even at times, two names for the same treatment of our collections. In the case of the Folgers XD515 manuscripts, waste texts were the spoiled materials that ensured the survival of other items, holding off the destructive forces of time with wrappers that themselves unevenly conserved fragments of a prior moment. Here's an example. Um, so this is a lease in a 17th century hand that lays out an agreement between Miles Hobart and Philip Carey over a plot of land in Morley, Yorkshire, and it's 20 acres known as James Wood. The precise terms of the lease need to be pieced together, however, because both edges were cropped and because Ware has scraped away the text in some places and torn the vellum in others. But the remaining portions show that for 69 pounds a year, Carey and his descendants were allowed to harvest timber and perhaps especially the rough undergrowth, but prohibited from raising woods and cultivating the land as tilled or pastured fields. This lease then was a document of conservation. It was a legal instrument that aimed to keep the destructive forces of human agriculture at bay. As landlord and tenant, Hobart and Carey were joined by an agreement to moderate the consumption of resources, maintaining the woods for future generations, and staving off um, the waste that this land might potentially become. But at some point, this lease stopped being read or even needed as a legal document of the agreement it recorded. It lost its value, and when we flip it over, we find a whole other history of conservation. The leftover vellum was measured, cut, and folded to become the, the wrapper on a fat collection of quarto pamphlets. The traces are faint, but in addition to a qualification to the terms of the lease and the leaseholder's signatures, which would have remained visible on the outside of the binding, it's amazing to think about, um, on the spine, there is a list of the multiple pamphlets gathered together to form a composite volume as well as a label that was presumably the shelf mark from an earlier library. So the ink on the, on the spine is significantly more faded than the lease, but with some extreme photoshopping, um, we can bring some of the contents partially into sight. And with some squinting, we can see here a numbered lease of 18 items. And with more squinting and zooming, I think I can start to read some of them. So number seven has a gardener in it. Number six, a Jane. Um, I'm sorry, 17 has a gardener in it. Six has a Jane in it. Seven is a coronation so sermon. And four includes Bishop of Rochester. 
Most identifiable is number eight, a fellow with the delightful name, I think it's Maggot um, or Megoat. I'm actually not quite sure how to say his name. Um, his name is Richard Maggot, I think. Um, the Dean of Winchester at his death in 1692 who was the author of at least 16 published sermons. I also think perhaps maybe I can read his name across the tear at the end of number 11, which is between two lines. Let me know if you want to squint with me later. So these titles and authors suggest that the Zalmabond was a compilation of religious tracts or perhaps even entirely of printed sermons. The outdated manuscripts lease, which had once guarded against the wasting of James Wood, was repurposed as a piece of textual waste that could protect the godly writing that flourished in the late 17th century print trade. Let me be clear that the echoes of content and the accompanying value judgment that we hear in the terminology of waste were not active for whether gathered and bound together this stack of pamphlets. Instead, the lease was being reused as a piece of material because its text had lost all value as something to be read. So here's the last bit of this story of consumption and conservation that I've been able to reconstruct, at least so far. Because the manuscript call numbers suggest that the compilation was disbound after it entered the Folger, I wanted to see if I could find any of the pamphlets that had once been preserved inside of Hobart's and Carey's wasted lease. Keyword searches for the terms in the spine turn up scores of potential matches in the Folger's collection. And what I really need to do is I need to go back, always go back to the library, um, to survey all of the potential items together to look for shared annotation or common binding patterns. Until then, I have a guess about one pamphlet, which is admittedly just a possibility. This is the Folger's copy of a 1690 sermon by Thomas Spratt, the Dean of Westminster and Bishop of Rochester. It shows evidence of disbinding and um, um, including remnants of stitches. It also has a manuscript number four on the title page, which is precisely the kind of annotation that we would expect to find on a pamphlet included as the fourth item in a book made of multiple compiled texts. And remember, indeed, the fourth item in the spine of our lease binding um, lists Bishop Rochester, the Bishop of Rochester. Again, I don't have quite enough details to definitively link this pamphlet to Hobart and Carey's wasted lease yet. But if this micro history of potential affiliations opens up a snarled undergrowth of textual consumption and care, these competing principles also remind us of the ways in which books were read and used and how those changed significantly after the moment in which they were made. In both the instant they were bound together and when they entered the library centuries later, these printed pamphlets and manuscripts had little value on their own. They were the excessive, even superfluous output of burgeoning systems of legal and religious textuality, and they were probably never intended to last for hundreds of years. Alone, both the lease and the 18 pamphlets were in danger of being consumed, spoiled, and transformed into waste, as they were used up by a quick success, succession of readers. But together, their compiled form was able to withstand passing time and shifting fashions, gaining a new value simply because they outlived their expiration date, even if the hybrid book that they made was far from perfect and probably impossible to collate. Thank you. All right, so we now have a, at least a little bit of time for a few questions. Um, once we get the chairs out here, we'll plop down and um, give you a moment to come up with something trenchant to uh, spoil our dinner later. <laughs> All right, we're good. Fantastic. So um, what I'll do is just so we can keep this... Um, Moving, I'll repeat your question back so that we, everybody in the room can hear it, but do try to project who's got something for us. Somebody's got it. Ellen. So we, so we have a question about sort of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a shot, Ellen. Let's see what I can, let me, I'm going to try this. So I'm going to see what I can conjure. So I think, I believe you have a question about, you know, this sort of status of the modern curator is yet to be firmly established by the time that we're in the period that um, Megan was talking about in her discussion. 
And the question is sort of, given the different kinds of artisans who are coming from a different tradition that were working with these books, whether or not we would imagine something being either done differently, if a, if a different kind of professional were doing this work, or what exactly we know about um, who was doing this kind of work at the Folger Library. I, th I think that's a fantastic question. Um, so I know his name, the binder, because Dawson names him, um, is Arla now. And I, what I now need to do is go back and figure out, you've given me something to do to figure out what Lanau's lineage is, and I don't know that, but it's a great place to go. Um, he, I think Lanau and Dawson together were interested in making very sturdy books. And yes, like re using every kind of technology that they had available. So this is a moment like tons of these, a lot of these pages are um, uh, inlaid in, or not inlaid, but sort of laminated with um, either, they're either silked or they're encased in like a tissue. So try to do everything, all right. And so we look at that and we think, ah, but, it, and it, it looks like um, it, it, it's legible, it's visible to us as, a, as an intervention. But on the other hand, this book can still be used. And we think about what might have happened to that title page if it had been, if something had happened to it earlier. So um, I entirely take your question that we might want to um, think, uh, one, that I need to know more about Lanau, um, and two, that we might think about this as a kind of, it's almost like, so in, in, in my home field of the English department, we think about the sort of emergence of subfields, right? The sort of increasing specialization of the discipline. And it seems to me that we're watching exactly the material equivalent of that in this, in what we decide to do with this book in 1966. So I, I think you're exactly right. We have time for about two more questions, maybe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. That was a question about, um, given the configuration of the preliminaries in the first folio, how is it that that, that two-leaf bifolium that I was obsessing over, um, how would that have actually been attached to the rest of the structure of the volume? Um, there are, the folio preliminaries actually occur in multiple configurations, and that's another day and several hours. But that configuration where the bifolium comes after um, A5 and before A6, means that it actually meets the stub that comes over from the title page. And so the title page, um, you know, in the illustration shows that it just sort of terminates at the spine, but it would have a, of a hook that would take it over across the gathering. So the title page could be sewn down. But once that hook comes over, you can adhere the other choir to it, if that makes sense, with adhesive. With adhesive, but then that sort of bizarro choir, that, that bizarro fold that you're making where you've got the title page and then this two-leaf sort of V, those can actually be sewn in as a unit. Um, but the problem, of course, is that very few first folios um, survive in early structures, and those that do have been so heavily conserved that it's often difficult to de determine this. But um, I, my understanding is that the, the main hypothesis for why it is that um, that Two leaf bifolium. I mean, there are organizational reasons why that bifolium would appear there, but because it's connecting to the title page, or the, the I'm sorry, not the the title page leaf, it allows it to actually be sewn into the structure in a primary way, in a way that wouldn't have been possible without that. Well, they they they're 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 trained professionals who could make it work if they knew where it went. I mean, sometimes you do see that two leaf bifolium after the catalog leaf. Um, and so it's kind of treated as a separate choir that can be dealt with in a number of different ways. But it's a very good question because part of this is like, well, how does the binder know not only what the order is and what the parts are, but how to actually go about accommodating the publisher's decision? Now, now the last thing I'll say is that the publishers, these are people who often operate, typically operate retail businesses of their own and often employ binders on site. And so they're not... Um, it's, we, we're not to imagine that they're not aware of the ways that this would have to be accommodated because they, these are people that um, operate a retail business that is generating structures like this all the time. So the question was about what exactly the state is when the customer is buying the book. So, so the, this is a thorn, a, that nasty can of worms. In early modern England, um, most it, there's long been an assumption that books were sold directly to customers in sheets, and that sometimes happened because bookbinding was part of the retail side of the business. 
However, um, most binding transactions seems to have been seem to have been managed in early modern England by the retailer. So, say I go to the bookstore and I say, "Hey, friend, I like a first folio," and he says, "What kind of binding do you want?" And I say, "I'm cheap. Let's do the sheepskin parchment." And then I go back in a few days, like back in the day when you had to like order a record from the record store, and you have to go back a week later and get your copy. That's kind of the way that binding seemed to work in early modern England, where for most people grabbing a stack of sheets and like schlepping them down the street was like not especially attractive. And so most booksellers knew how to accommodate that by either doing the binding in-house themselves or sending it to another, another person. Yes. Thanks, Kurt. I'm, I'm going to actually give this question to Catherine because I think it's this question about um, who, who exactly are the different figures in the, in the world of the book that are interested in doing this kind of collation and perfection and especially the marking of it. And I think the Rawlinson case um, presents a, a really good example because we, well, give it a shot. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> well, I, I think, um, I mean, part of what um, this panel raises in such interesting ways is, and, and, and particularly I think as well both of the questions, is the way in which the textual object appears slightly different over time to the different uh, participants in that process, whether it's a curator or a conservator or a collector in the early 18th century or um, a, a consumer in, you know, our always imagined consumer in the early 17th century. And so, so I, I do think that um, you know, in the Rawlinson's case, that you see um, multiple audiences among his, uh, among their correspondents, um, and then what's really interesting about this as well is that I think, despite um, the effort to be, um, the effort to a, a later um, and satisfyingly uh, distinct and scientific approach to these moments of production and consumption, what you actually see when you look at the really messy archival or um, correspondence record that surrounds this is that, that multiple people are having at the same moment different perspectives on how these processes should be conducted. And so I actually think, you know, I, I think the one, um, the one question that I, I really want to think about um, going forward um, from both of your papers, and the question I guess I would ask, is the weight that we put on Moxon um, as, as the sort of person who is articulating how early modern books worked um, for us as the later consumers of so many of these processes, when I think many of the histories um, that have defined those books for us were, as, as you both say, um, were written in the, in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And so there's a way in which this sort of imagined contemporary is always something that we're, we're always um, having this you know, tremendously mediated state. And Moxon seems to be the very, I would say, artificial voice that's interpreting a lot of that for us. And so all of these terms are being defined in a way that we then take as a kind of authoritative lexicon, when in fact, you know, I, I question the extent to which um, they actually would have been describing processes that would have been so um, distinct distinctly articulated at the time. And so I guess the long answer is that what I really uh, love about um, both of your papers in particular is just how messy um, those processes were and, and how particularly they, they change, uh, our perspective on them changes over time. I think it's really interesting. Thank you. One more question, all the way in the back there, by the column. Thank you. That was a um, an observation um, about a a work. What's the name of the work by Irving? That's right. That's right. A, a, an essay by Washington Irving about the mutability of literature that is thinking through many of the same questions that that Megan addressed in her talk about um, the necessity of recycling and the necessity of waste. Do you want to give a shot? Um, so what was particularly uh, poignant was that you were describing a, a, a book, right, a quarto book shouting back, why am I never read? Um, and that made me think actually about Catherine's talk about this, ab about a book collector who had so many, he probably was not reading these four rooms of books that he had. He couldn't even get in the room to sleep, let alone to like find the books at the back of the stack. Um, and I actually, I, I might think that little book that was screaming might have survived because it wasn't read, um, because, it, because it wasn't torn to pieces. Yeah. 
so um, I mean, I think thinking about like collecting and reading as, or, like where and how those those acts intersect is really interesting. And I don't know if Catherine has any examples about Rawlinson that you might want to tell us. Does, did he read? Or did he just? <laughs> did, well, I, I think that's, I mean, one of the really interesting questions this raises is this idea of the imagined reader and, and, and Rawlinson, uh, whatever it was he was doing, he was certainly not reading. But I think when we are imagining, you know, whoever's binding or these moments of this sort of uh, transgression of, of waste, that there's always an imagined observer there that we frequently uh, project ourselves to um, uh, that is, is, is giving that a particular interpretation. I, I think that's the curatorial interpretation also, that the, that the books will be shouting back at you in the middle of the night. <laughs> all right, well, we've, uh, we've reached the time, and I, and I would like to invite all of you to join us for a reception outside, get a copy of the Collated and Perfect publication, um, and thank you very much, and I'd like to have you guys thank the people on my sides, but not so much me. <laughs> <laughs>